After conducting extensive backbreaking research, I've come to the conclusion that maybe you guys want to see a video about chams. For those of you who have no clue what the guy in your computer is talking about, chams look something like this, and by the end of this video you will know how to abuse the way CSGO renders models to change their colors, make them visible through walls, and even how to disable occlusion to get the most out of your chams, so be absolutely sure to stick around. In CSGO, models are actually split into two main components, those being the mesh and the material. Meshes look something like this, and they are essentially a bunch of points in the world, known as vertices, that come together to form the shape of our model. Materials can be thought of as the skin of the model. This is the texture that is wrapped around the mesh to complete our model. In order to make chams, we need to modify the material that a model is being drawn with, and we can do this with the iStudio render interface. This interface gives us access to a few very important functions. Force material override allows us us to override a model's material. The set color modulation and set alpha modulation functions let us modify the colors of the model, and most importantly, the draw model function is what draws every model in the game. This is the function that we are going to be hooking in order to make our chams. Down below you will find a link to this GitHub repository. It is a base that I've been working on to use in these videos. It contains everything that you will need to follow along with this tutorial. So either clone it by clicking the green code button, or use it as a reference to follow along in your own project. If you clone the repository, you'll find a zipped version of the code in your downloads folder. Go ahead and unzip it to wherever you want. You can now open the folder and double click on the base.sln file to open up the project. This should open up Visual Studio. All you need to do now is change the configuration from debug x64 to release x86 and we can get going. As I mentioned earlier, we're going to be hooking the draw model function. To hook a function, we need two pieces of information. Firstly, we need the signature of the function, which tells us what parameters it takes and what type it returns. Then we need the address of the function. If we take a look at the draw model function in the source SDK, we can see that it is virtual. This means that it will be stored in iStudio renders virtual table, and therefore we can easily get the address of the function if we know its index. We can see that iStudio render inherits from iAppSystem. iAppSystem is an interface that contains nine functions in CSGO, which means that begin frame over here is the 10th function in the virtual table, or in other words, the function at the 9th index. With this information, if you count down starting from 9, you'll find out that draw model is at index 29 in the iStudio render interface. Over here in hooks.h, we can create our draw model type def. We use the this call convention here because it is a function in a class, and therefore we need to give it the class pointer as the first argument when we call it. We can now create a variable using this type def. This variable is to be the game's draw model function. Remember, when hooking functions, you always need to call the original function in order to restore the game's code execution, because we are diverting it to our own function after all. Finally, we can create our hooked draw model function. This is the function in our code that the game is going to call when it thinks it is calling its own draw model function. It is going to be very similar to the type def that we just made earlier, but take note of the standard call calling convention. Moving into hooks.cpp, inside of the setup function, we are going to create our hook. Minhook is already included in this project, so all we need to do is call mh underscore create hook. The first parameter is going to be the address of the function. Remember that index we got earlier? This is where we use it, index 29, in combination with the memory get function, which returns a pointer to the function at the index specified. Next, we're going to give minhook a reference to the function we want to replace draw model with, which of course is our own draw model function. And finally, we need to tell minhook where to store the address of the original function so that we can call it later, which looks something like this. All right, now you can navigate to the bottom of this file beneath the included create move hook, and we can create the body of our draw model function like so. You can leave it empty for the moment. We can see that the second parameter of our draw model function is a constant reference to a class called C draw model info. If we take a look at this class, the seventh variable is an iClient renderable pointer. What does this pointer belong to exactly? Well, it belongs to the entity that the game is trying to draw when our hook is called iClient renderable is an interface that every client entity needs to implement. But to us in the scope of this video, it is not very useful because it is not the same as a regular entity pointer, meaning that we can't call entity virtual functions or even use netvars. For that, we need the base entity pointer. There is some good news though, because if we take a look at this interface in the source SDK, we can see that the first function returns an iClient unknown pointer. And if we check that interface out, one of the functions returns the base entity pointer. This is the key to our chams. We need to identify what entity draw model is trying to draw, and therefore we can use the iClient renderable pointer to get the base entity pointer. Luckily for you, I already have this all implemented in the base, so let's hop back into our hook. The first thing that we're going to do is use an if statement to make sure that our local player and the renderable pointer are not null. 
We have to do this because if we try call functions from either of these pointers while they are null, we will crash faster than the Russian economy after invading Ukraine. Now we can get the base entity pointer through the iClient renderable interface that we just discussed. Once again, we are going to use an if statement to make sure that the entity pointer is not null. We can then make sure that the entity is in fact a player. And finally, we can check if they are an enemy by comparing our team numbers. At this point, we know that we have a valid enemy player that is trying to be rendered. That kind of sounds like the perfect candidate to apply our champs to. We're going to create a static iMaterial pointer, which is going to be the material that we want to override the player with. We can use the material system interface to find a material by name like so. We make it static because we do not need to find the material every time this function gets called because material pointers do not change. In this video, I'm going to use the debug ambient cube material, but ultimately you can use any material that you like. I'll leave a link down below Below to a list of common materials that people like to use. Now we can create two float arrays to hold our colors. These are stored as float percentages. Please keep in mind if you want to change these colors with a menu then you should put these arrays into the globals namespace but I'm going to keep it simple and make the colors constant. Next we can set the alpha of our material by calling set alpha modulation from the studio render interface. I'm just going to set it once here because I want my hidden and visible champs to have the maximum alpha but I suggest you play around with this value. To make champs different colors when hidden and visible, we first need to override the model with a material that is visible through walls. Then we need to override it again with a material that is not visible through walls. Firstly, we're going to set our materials ignore Z flag to true. This makes the material show through walls. Then we can set the color of the hidden layer. Next, we override the player's material with our custom material. And finally, we call the original draw model function to draw the player model with our custom material. We now need to repeat this process, but with the ignore Z flag set to false. This is so that the top layer is the one that doesn't show through walls. We set the color to the visible color. We override the material and then we draw the model once again. The last thing we're going to do is reset the material override by overriding the material with a null pointer. Importantly, we are also going to return out of the function here because by this point, we have already rendered our player with our champs. The last thing that we need to do in this hook is call the original draw model function right at the end to render every other model that we are not applying champs to. Cool, that just about wraps up our champs so far. So let's build our cheat and hop in game to test it out. I'll catch you guys there. All right, so I'm in game and I've just injected and as you can see, we have our charms working correctly. You can see our hidden layer and our visible layer. Remember, you can change these colors by changing those float arrays that we made earlier. So then, that wraps up the video. I hope you guys enjoyed. I've decided to split this into two parts. The next part will cover disabling occlusion to extend the range of the chams, and furthermore, how to use the key value system to create your own custom materials. If you want to help the channel out and get access to all the code used in my videos, be sure to check out my Patreon down below. And obviously, massive shout out to those of you who already support me over there on Patreon. Anyway, ladies and gentlemen, cheers, thanks for watching, and I'll see you guys in the next video.